Ignite Talks. Now, the Ignite Talks, if you're not familiar with that format, it's a five-minute talk. You have up to 20 slides maximum, and the slides auto advance every 15 seconds. So uh, today we have a, a great lineup of Ignite speakers. We're going to have seven Ignite Talks. So the first speaker that we have coming up today is Robbie Lockman. Rock Robbie's coming all the way from Atlanta. He's actually part of DevOps Days Atlanta. And we're speaking, we'll be speaking to us today about burritos. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Ooh, that doesn't look like my talk. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> Absolutely. Ah, OK. Um, so I'll be talking about burritos today, the 12-layer burrito versus the 12-factor app. It's going to be quite apparent that I'm an expert in burritos and not cloud-native applications. So any questions about burritos, come talk to me after cloud-native apps, not so much. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm a tech evangelist at AppDynamics. I've worked at a few places before. Uh, some of my specialties, I systematically corrupted many production databases, systematically corrupted. And also, I can't do a CIDR calculation, divide by 8 or divide by 16. Most of my outages have to do with that. But why am I up here talking about burritos? Now, we always, when talking about technology, we talk about feeds and speeds, but we never use taste. I used to work for an app server vendor and said we need to have a blind app server taste test. JBoss tastes the best, right? They thought I was crazy. Now I have a different job. <laughs> Some key differences between a burrito and a 12-factor app. Um, a burrito is food native. The 12-factor app is cloud native. Um, burritos are easily eaten. 12-factor uh, apps, you can't really eat them. They're not tangible. Uh, burritos were the original container. They were holding things before Linux containers um, 1890s. <laughs> <Let's>, uh, <laughs> um, so talk about code base, right? So you should have one code base track in revision control. So as you see here, here's the burrito code base. Uh, really, you're making your code base uh, what you make your bills on. This will play really nicely into the second part. Dependencies. Uh, you can't have a burrito without these delicious cows here. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Explicitly isolate your dependencies and use a package manager. Don't have any implicit dependencies in your, your particular uh, build or package because you never know where it's going to run. Like to run, where, run everywhere, talk, exactly that. Uh, configuration, OK. So store your configuration in your environment. If you're deploying an application from, let's say, dev to QA to prod, uh, most likely your config is going to change, right? So you want to make sure that you're storing the configuration somewhere close in the environment so you have access to it. Ah, backing services, yes. So <laughs> treat your backing services as attached resources. And so what does this mean? Everyone's part of the same team, right? So in, in distributed application land, let's say states managed by a database, if one of the nodes in a database, like your Cassandra ring goes down, you still have access to it. Uh, build, release, and run, right? So you want to separate your applications into multiple stages. So you build of the build or release candidate. And then what's the difference between build and release? Is a configuration. You might build something for dev and release it in QA or UAT. And then your running state, again, you're having the configs to have it run in, um, in prod. Separate those stages, uh, processes. So part of the 12 factor manifesto is actually having stateless apps, right? So you want to uh, ex isolate the processes into stateless app processes, and also have your backing services, such as that database, manage the separate process, uh, port binding. So burritos are bound by rice. Great. Um, <laughs> your applications might be bound by ports. So if you have multiple services in your application, it's always a good idea to port offset. So something might be over 8080, something over 8090, and so on and so on to follow some sort of mathematical convention for that. Uh, concurrency. Um, when you're scaling out your application, make sure to scale it out via a particular process model. So what does this mean? Uh, from Java days, maybe you're running an application server as one JVM. Um, you have maybe separate applications running separate threads. And make sure you define that process model clearly, because one thing you don't want to have is overrun. Ah. <laughs> Disposability. Throwing your burrito away is just as important as eating it for the first time, right? So having your application gracefully shut down is also as important as having gracefully start up. So don't forget this in your design paradigm uh, when you're building it. Uh, dev, prod, parity. I, I can make some really good jokes about this. But again, having your environments have configuration control and be closest together is also important. You don't want to find out something doesn't work in production. It's like, oh, that was a configuration issue. So again, having you know, key to the manifesto is dev, prod, parity. And logs. Ah, your logs should tell a story. So if you look here, this person spent $104 at Taco Bell. I don't know what story this person has from the night before. <laughs> yeah, if I spend over $10 at Taco Bell, I have a problem. But again, your log should tell a story, just not gra granular data. And lastly, I, I love Krispy Kreme. I was thinking how I can put a donut in here, is that your admin process should not run in the same process that is monitoring, right? So if you're using some sort of platform and you have a monitoring platform, make sure that particular process is not running on the, pl the 
uh, architecture you're, you're looking at. That's it for me. I think I did it under five minutes. Um, stay hungry. You can hit me up at rlakma or uh, rlakma at cisco.com. So super excited. If you guys want to get burritos afterwards, uh, hit me up. So. All right, next up we have Ivan Fan. Ivan is a senior software engineer, local here to the area, and he's speaking to us about managing infrastructure in the cloud. Hello. So I'd like to see a show of hands for anyone here who has ever used or operated a computer. <laughs> all right, so I feel like I should see all hands or I may be at the wrong conference. All right, so I'll just jump straight in. So um, I'm gonna describe three ways that any of you can um, improve your, the way you manage your cloud infrastructure. But first, a little bit up about me. So I'm Ivan, born and raised from Texas, completed my computer engineering degree from UT Arlington, cross town. Um, I'm actually currently a software engineer at GE Digital, working on the Predix infrastructure engineering team. So those of you who aren't familiar with Predix, it's GE Digital's IoT platform for IoT applications and services. We ingest massive amounts of IoT data and let developers like you build applications on top of Predix. Um, Hopefully the next slide shows up. But um, so um, okay. So um, I've actually been able to be a part of the transformation with how we manage our cloud infrastructure. When I first started, it was very manual, ad hoc, everything through the console. And now today, we live in a automated infrastructure as code based environment, leveraging Terraform Enterprise. So those of you who aren't familiar with Terraform Enterprise, it's pretty much the Terraform open source project plus an automated pipeline to, del to deliver all these um, Terraform configurations on top of any public cloud provider or even on top of vCenter. Um, so yeah, so I tried to break it down into three things that you can do to help improve the way you manage your cloud infrastructure. So the first um, thing is culture. It's not a DevOps Day conference unless there's a, a slide on culture. So um, for me, I found that um, everyone has to be on board with the automation and the infrastructure as code benefits. Some ways to drive this culture change is maybe you can provide only read-only access to the console and force people to use the CLI or tools like Terraform, right? Or something a little bit more abrasive is you can create a CloudWatch alarm to detect any manual changes via the console that sends an alert to a Slack channel that says, hey, Ivan made a bunch of manual changes via the console and publicly shame him. <laughs> this should change the culture pretty quickly. Realistically, within our organization, we mandate that all changes made to our infrastructure to be done via our Terraform pipeline. So those of you who aren't actually familiar with Terraform, it's a way to define your cloud infrastructure via a markup language called HCL, or HashiCorp configuration language. Then um, the second thing is, if it flips over, is to start small when you, when you start your Terraform journey. I highly recommend to start something with simple like IAM roles or IAM policies then gradually work your way into more complex configurations, like an elastic load balancer in front of an auto-scaling group with some complex launch configuration. You can ensure that if you can define it in Terraform, that you can repeat the same exact configuration. Another thing I recommend with, um, for Terraform is to leverage Terraform modules when possible. This will help reduce the amount of code duplication across your environments, and if you use a really good versioning strategy, you can ensure that all your modules and all your environments are using the exact same version, which equals the exact same configuration. Then the third and final thing to um, think about when managing cloud infrastructure is to get with it, right? No pun intended. Um, so you'll find that infrastructure as code and source control go hand in hand. I highly recommend that you store all of your source, or all of your Terraform configurations in some form of source control be it subversion, TFS, or ClearCase. Not sure why you're still using ClearCase, but if you are, go ahead and update your resume. Uh, so for us, we use Git for our source control. We really like the collaborative workflow Git provides you. We encourage anyone within our organization to make a pull request against our infrastructure for any change that they want to make. Um, so whenever a pull request is submitted, it goes down a code review process, along with some basic Terraform linting. And we, you can even use a framework called Kitchen Terraform to test your infrastructure against the actual Terraform configurations. So after our pull request is approved and merged to master, we actually have an automated Terraform pipeline to push this configuration out to our environments. This ensures that at any time, our infrastructure reflects our master branch. And lastly, thank you, DevOps Days, and thank you to all the organizers who make this possible. And go Cowboys.
is going to talk to talk to us about those commit messages when we uh, commit our source code to our repositories. So this uh, speaker is uh, David, and uh, David has over 20 years of experience in the industry. He's going to talk to us about getting committed. Thank you. All right, well, my name is David Ayers, and I'm here to talk about Git commit messages and pull requests. So it's really exciting. It's riveting. Uh, so I'm going to start with a quote that you've probably seen. Uh, Programs must be written for people to be read and only incidentally for, peop uh, for machines to execute. So I'm going to introduce, introduce a corollary quote today, which is that pull requests and commits must be written for people to read and only incidentally to fulfill the needs of a particular user story. All right, so that's free for you guys. You can use this in all your presentations. Um, but the point is that commit messages should tell a story. They should explain what you're doing and why you're doing it, right? So the code itself is, is, should be self-explanatory. Everyone here writes amazing, good code, right? right? So the commit messages should tell the story behind the code, not what it does. I know I said what earlier. Not what it does, but how and why it does what it does, right? So that meta information about the code that's in your head at the time you're writing it is crucially important to capture. So a year from now, when you're looking back in the rearview mirror or someone on your team is looking back in the rearview mirror, understanding what you did and why you did it is very important, right? How many times have you been trying to fix a bug and you're like, hey, I was the one that did this. I don't even know what that commit message means or why it's there, right? So it's really important to get this stuff right. So um, I'm gonna assume that for the rest of this talk that everyone's using Git and that everyone's using some sort of pull or merge request workflow. If you're not, like he said earlier, uh, probably maybe look for something else. Um, so I'm not gonna, like any good technologist, uh, I believe in code reuse, right? So there's this great blog post by Chris Beams about structuring your uh, actual commit messages. So he, he outlines seven things that make up great commit messages. So again, I'm not gonna go necessarily in detail, but really the point is write good commit messages and use the commit to explain what and why versus how. Right, so I, it's a great article, it goes in through all these things in a lot of details, and every modern source control, or like GitHub and GitLab, understands this format and encourages you to use this format. So again, I mentioned earlier, your commit messages should tell a story. They should lead the reviewer or yourself through the series of logical steps that you went through, and, and they should be atomic units. Each commit should be an atomic unit that builds on the ones that came before it, like bricks in a wall, to help tell a story. So we're going to look at a couple of quick examples of what to do right and what to do wrong. So here's a pull request I did against a Spring MVC project to introduce a new controller method. And you can immediately see, like, what the heck did I do? I changed 419, added 419 lines, removed 306 lines. That sounds like a lot more is going on. If I click on the Files Change tab, this is what you see. How many of you see, have seen a commit message like this with a bajillion things change and you have no idea what's going on, right? It's impossible to review and it's impossible to understand. So let's take a look at that same thing done in a better format, right? So now we've got a series of logical commits. There was some refactoring that was done, some code reformatting, some spring changes, and finally the salient work is at the bottom introducing the new controller methods. And now you can click on files change for each of those commits and get a very clear understanding of what was done at each step along, those pa along that path. So another thing I've seen in commit messages are some anti-patterns, some, some things that you really shouldn't do. Um, despite some of them being funny, like everyone, everyone enjoys humor, everyone enjoys com uh, funny stuff, but not in your commit messages. That's not the place to be a humorist, right? Or things like fix sonar violations or address PR feedback, or the last one's the worst. Like, I don't know what poop rocket means, but it, it's, and that's a real example, by the way. Um, so, <laughs> um, so doing this requires discipline, right? You have to focus on, on how you do your work in a way that other people can consume it. And luckily, Git provides some pretty good tools to help you do this, like interactive rebasing, right? So a lot of people are scared of rebasing. There's really no reason to be. Um, but if with an interactive rebase, say you've done a series of commits, 
and you realize you should have done some refactoring at the beginning of that work. Right now with interactive rebase, you can move that commit to look like it happened at the beginning and the history still tells the story you want to tell. So in the description of this talk, I said it's like writing a love letter to your future self. And maybe that's weird to some people. But it really is. Like putting care and attention into these things really matters. It matters for you and it matters for your team. The other benefit that you get from doing something like this is it changes the way you think about things, right? We want to break our work into small chunks so we can do it well. And now we're thinking about how to break our work into small chunks so that our people that are reviewing it can understand it. So that becomes like a self-reinforcing cycle that uh, helps you write better code and better code commits. So thanks. I hope you guys found something useful. Peace out. Our next speaker to the stage will be talking to us about tool selection and DevOps. So let's bring to the stage Karum Khan, or as his friends call him, KK. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that's not my presentation. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Khuram Khan. I'm from Newt Global. Uh, hit me up on Twitter, and my email is out there. Uh, we work as a consulting organization to various companies for tools. And when we talk about tools, you know, the market is filled with DevOps tools, right? Everybody's targeting continuous delivery. No single tool is going to be a silver bullet. So, so don't fall into that trap. And automation is the key. And you'll see this word coming up again and again about automation and why it is key to getting your tooling and your entire strategy around DevOps uh, complete. Because if you're going to go into, a market, into just taking up tools and thinking that this is the panacea, it's not going to work out that way. Right? You'll have to get into automation. You'll have to build the pipeline. This is the kind of landscape, and if any of the companies are here whom I've not represented, I apologize right now. But, but you can see that if every step of the way, there are so many tools. It's a problem of plenty to have, actually. And many of them are almost, almost the same. right? So it's not going to be like you know, you're picking one and you're not picking the others. Right? It's, it, it, is, it, is the, it is a market saturation where there are so many tools that are come. You come into any of the conferences, that's what you're going to see. So where do you begin? Start with in-house tools. Start with what you have, right? You get a common strategy around the dev and the ops teams. Shameless plug, right? Partner with the right system integrator. Don't make mistakes yourself. Learn from the other people's mistakes. Focus on automation. Common theme, again, I'm uh, telling you. Scale incrementally. Don't try to do, do a big thing all at the same time. Try to do a proof of concept. Build it. Evangelize that proof of concept in, in your organization. It will help you in the long run. Focus on the core tooling. And I've uh, kind of, we kind of go with the five core tooling processes. Version control, configuration management, the right orchestration tool, the right deployment tools, and the right testing tools. And in each of them, what you have to see is, how are you building the processes to, in order for you to get automation and done in all of these tools? And how do they integrate along with your you know, existing tools. If you're, if you're on open source and, you know, oh, sorry, if you're on Microsoft platform and you're only using open source tool, tools, there may be a conflict, right? So try and sort that out as well. Uh, build pipeline processes, right? Have common tools for these uh, dev, QA, and infrastructure. Use tools for every step. Capture and log everything. It's important. There should be no manual process and out of the way processes. That's the way it fails. Enforce automation again, common theme. Right? And ensure continuous feedback. Because if you're not putting the feedback, that's where it's going to fail. Uh, simplify tool chain processes. I apologize for the color. I asked my daughter to do it. She said, I have to get pink inside it. So yeah, but this is a simplified tool chain process, which talks about plan, develop, continuous build, automated, automated testing, and adapt and scale. I talked about a common theme. It's automation, right? You get to get infrastructure automation, testing automation, and deployment automation. I'll give you a small anecdote. Uh, uh, we talked to a customer and said, hey, we have the tools, but you know, we're not getting the benefit. It's, it's still taking the same time. I said, what about unit testing? Oh, that takes seven days for manual testing. So it's not going to work, right? You have to automate it. Um, that's, that was in the heart of DevOps, and hopefully we'll, we'll move the screen up. Yeah. So this is an illustration. We actually did this for one of our customers. 
you know, we build the whole continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous improvement. We used some of the tools, um, which you can see Jenkins was used as a heart for orchestration. We used Maven for build. We did Selenium testing. We used Nexus for repository. Um, and, and we deployed it both on-prem on OpenStack as well as on AWS Cloud. Not saying that you, know, you have to use these tools. All we are saying, and we're not promoting any one of them. We are, all we are saying is that this helped in order for us to build this. And look beyond tooling. I mean, somebody said, you know, you can't do it without mentioning culture. Cultural change. Get senior management buy-in. Trust me, it helps. Uh, have measurable milestones. Uh, you need to figure out where you're going to come in, where, how you're going to measure it, what is your success criteria. And go ahead. Be your agent of change, right? Tell your organization, this is the way we would like to do it. These are the tools that will be helpful to get those changes done. And that's about all I have time. Pants. He's going to come to us today and speak to us about using Docker to build software. Let us welcome James Thomas. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I'm James. I'm a developer at ThoughtWorks. And for about the uh, past uh, year and a half or two years, I've been focusing mostly in, in the CI and CD space, focusing on building pipelines that that help people deliver software more reliably and more repeatably. And one of the tools that I've been using lately is, is Docker. Um, so first of all, a, a disclaimer. This is not uh, about Dockerizing your application. This is a technique that'll work just fine if you're building a, a monolith or a microservice, uh, whether or not your deliverable is a fat jar or a slim native binary. It really doesn't care about your tool chain. It's completely agnostic. Um, another disclaimer, if you have a strong infrastructure as code uh, discipline already in your organization, this talk may not be very helpful to you. Uh, what I've seen in a lot of organizations, though, is that they don't tend to treat their build agents with the same um, care that they do the rest of their infrastructure, and so this might be something that's helpful to you. Um, so what is this? It's, it's just a, simply taking the, the steps that you use to build your software and putting them inside a Docker container. And you might ask why, um, because it helps decouple your build process from the underlying agent in such a way that your builds become more reliable and reproducible. Um, so let me talk about a couple of problems. One is that build agents are often managed by uh, other teams. Uh, those other teams might have different priorities than you. They may not be able to make the changes that you need to, to get your build working in as timely manner as you can. Um, another thing is that a shared agent pool will frequently turn into a collection of snowflakes. Have you ever had the problem where a build has failed and so you SSH into the build agent to uh, troubleshoot the problem? Um, when you do that, you're making subtle changes to the agent, which will make them even drift further from uh, the, the correct state. Um, Another benefit is that using a Docker container to, to, to build your software makes it easier for you to reproduce your build environment locally. Uh, there is an asterisk there. I'll go over a couple of reasons why that's not always true. Um, but it's something that's really nice. Um, so then you might ask what the catch is. Um, it's, it's definitely a, a technique that does have some, some downsides. And I'll, I'll talk about them uh, here as we go along. Um, let's see. Next slide. So um, the, the first thing I'll talk about is that differences between the host OS actually can matter. And I'll, I'll describe a real uh, situation that I, I faced not too long ago. Um, we had a test that was read on our Red Hat-based build agents. Um, our build container was Red Hat-based, and the test worked perfectly fine on our, our Mac workstations. Um, and so you'd think the, the environments are going to be the same, right? And, and that's not the case. Uh, Docker for Mac uses the underlying storage engine of the host operating system. And by default, Mac file systems are case insensitive. Uh, Red Hat and pretty much every other variety of Linux is case sensitive. And so the problem was is that we had an import that had an uppercase file name when the file was actually lowercase. Um, additionally, there is going to be some uh, amount of a performance penalty for using a container. It tends to be pretty small, but it is definitely something that's noticeable. And then uh, another thing is that it's, it's another point of failure for your build. It, it does add a little bit of complexity. Um, however, I think that the benefits outweigh the, 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 the downsides. Um, so let me tell you about a few tips that I've found in the course of working with this. Uh, first thing is the dash dash rm flag. The, the first problem that you will run into when you try using this technique is that um, if you are not careful about your container hygiene, you will end up with uh, problems like running out of space on your, your build agents. Using the RM flag on every operation that you run cleans that up for you automatically. 
Um, mounting the current working directory uh, is also the next thing that you'll, you'll really want to do because uh, a container needs to have both the code that you need in order to build it and you also want to be able to get the artifacts of your build out of that container. Mounting the working directory makes it easy to do this. Um, on the other hand then, uh, if you make use of this, this, this technique um, to mount the current working directory in, you really have to be careful about file permissions because by default containers run as a root user uh, and that means that any files that are created inside of your container during the, the run might also end up being created as, as restricted. And so if you pass the current user, your current user, into the Docker container, that prevents that. It means that when new files are created, they're created as the user that you're, you're currently operating as. Um, Docker Compose is something that I make use of for my build containers whenever I have a lot of environment variables that I need to pass into my, my build environment. Because it's way easier to, to add a bunch of environment variables to a Docker Compose YAML file than it is to pass a bunch of dash E flags on the command line. Um, last tip is testing your container. Um, I highly recommend this. Um, there are a few tools out there. One that I like is uh, Docker spec. It's basically a light wrapper around server spec, which is a great framework for testing uh, infrastructure. Uh, I recommend testing things like um, connectivity and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, so I, I like this technique, um, and it, it, I had to talk about it in a very brief manner because I only have five minutes. Um, but one of the nice things is that this has a lot of support for basically all modern uh, CI systems, Team City, Jenkins, Circle CI, Travis, basically everything else. It makes it a lot easier to use. So I, I definitely recommend, recommend trying it out. Uh, thank you. Well, next up, we have more representation from Verizon. We have a senior solutions architect that will be coming to the stage speaking to us about uh, avoiding the distributed monolith. Next up, let us welcome um, <laughs> Mohammed Bayan. Thank you, Frankie. Hello, everyone. So my name is Mohammed Bayan. I'm a solution architect with Verizon. And uh, we can start off with a show of hands. Who is building or delivering a microservices system today? That's it. All right. So microservices has been a really hot topic in the industry in the past few years. And a lot of organizations are migrating from monolithic applications to microservices. And they're doing so due to the claimed benefits of microservices. They're easier to build. You get, they're independently deployable. You get technology diversity, precision scalability, fault isolation. And it's easier to scale development with microservices. Now the question is, do you truly realize these benefits the way you're building microservices? So to help answer that question, let's start off with a very high level architectural diagram of a microservices, right? You have a set of services. Each service manages its own database. And then you're exposing these services for internal and external consumptions through APIs. So, um, but then you had the monolithic app that was a single process. You're going towards a set of processes that have to behave as a single app. Then you have a distributed system. In order for you to build, deliver, and operate a robust distributed microservice system, there are certain capabilities that need to be in place. Things like service discovery. How does service A discover service B? Service routing, configuration management, traffic management. Monitoring and logging becomes more complex for distributed system. Distributed tracing becomes a must-have. All these capabilities are needed to be in place. In addition to the capabilities that are needed at the services layer, there are certain capabilities needed at the API layer, and there are certain capabilities needed for the purpose of automation. Collectively, all these capability, Gartner calls them out the outer architecture. Now, how you build a single microservice, whether you build it in Spring Boot, Java Service, .NET Core, Node.js, it doesn't matter. That's the inner architecture. So your microservices logical architecture is an outer architecture plus an inner architecture. Cool. So how are you solving for the outer architecture in your microservices system? Most likely, you don't want to custom build it yourself. You bring in a framework or a toolkit to solve for that. And some of the commonly used ones in the industry is Netflix OSS, Spring Cloud, Play Anaka, and there are other ones. So you bring in this framework or bring in this toolkit. How does a single microservice consume the capability provided by the framework? Well, you have to add a library or a network client inside your microservice. But what did you just do? Didn't you just couple the whole system by binary dependencies? Some in the industry call this a distributed monolith. Basically, you took your monolithic application and you spread it over the network. So what are the problem or what are the observed outcome or behaviors of a distributed monolith? Well, number one, you have temporal coupling. A service cannot exist in your ecosystem unless you add that layer, that layer of binary dependencies. Number two, you have operational complexity. Um, imagine you have a service discovery like Eureka. 
and you modified the network client. You just impacted 100% of the services in your ecosystem. You have to do the upgrade and the lockstep. That's complex. Number three, you lose some of the benefits of microservices. Things like polyglot or, or technology diversity. In a Spring Cloud ecosystem, you can only build Spring Boot Java services. In Play Eka, you can only build Eka actors. You lose polyglot and you lose the ability to embrace new technologies. Finally, you have organizational or technical coupling. One of the characteristics of microservices is decentralized governance. Well, you don't have it. Any change, you have to go back to the platform team who owns the auto architecture. So what's the solution? How do you avoid the distributed monolith? You should only depend on data contracts and network protocol and nothing more than that. That's how the internet works, and that's the premise of APIs. You should be exposing your capabilities as APIs, hiding the implementation behind it. So what are we saying? What everybody's been doing is wrong. No. So remember, right, when Netflix went to the cloud back in 2009 and 2010, they were running on top of EC2 instances and AWS. That's infrastructure as a service. They had to build the outdoor architecture themselves. Same thing for Akka, it was 2010. Since then, there's been a lot of advancement in technologies, Docker, Kubernetes, PCF, a concept of a service mesh. So even serverless compute like Lambda, right? So if you're building microservices today, your strategy should be different. Because depending how much abstraction you have on top of your infrastructure, your outdoor architecture implementation should be different and your strategy should be different. So if we take, for example, right, there have been a couple of talks about containers and Kubernetes, and Kubernetes becoming the de facto standard for container orchestration in the industry. With Kubernetes, I get some of the capability out of the box, like service discovery and service routing and configuration management. I add a service mesh to that, I get all my capabilities in the services layer out of the box. More importantly, I'm not adding any binary dependencies on my services. That means I'm avoiding the distributed monolith. And that means I can build my services in any language I want in one app, whether .NET Core, Node.js, whatever you need it. So to summarize, right, if you're building microservices today or you're taking that route, uh, please don't build them as if it's 2009, 2010. Try to leverage the platform, whether that a CAS, a PaaS, or a function as a service. Hopefully you'd look into something called a service mesh in order to avoid the distributed monolith, and hopefully you'll start realizing the benefits of microservices. Thank you, everyone. So uh, next up, we have coming to the stage someone who is a uh, software developer, an architect, an agile proponent, and someone who's going to speak to us about ethics of software development. She is also a 2017 DevOps Days DFW speaker. Let's welcome to the stage Jane Prusakova. Thank you very much, Franklin. Thank you for having me back. It's, it's great to be back on the stage. So are you ready to talk about ethics of software development as an industry? My name is Jane Prusakova. You can find me on Twitter, you can find me by email, and I'll be around if you want to talk about it in more details. I work for Improvin. We are located just a few minutes away from here. Improvin is a software consultant uh, company. We offer agile training and uh, software development consulting. More importantly, we think that trust with customers is the best thing we can do, we can do right. Let's talk about being a professional. Who thinks of themselves as a professional? I expect to see all the hands up there. <laughs> we are not, as, software, as being in software development industry, we are not professionals in the same sense as medical uh, or legal profession. This is going too fast. Please read the quote. It's from one of my favorite blogs, Code Horror. I hope you've all heard, heard of it. If you haven't, go and find your favorite uh, re record. You don't need to read the entire thing. But it's worth reading. This is going to the heart of software development ethics. OK. Being ethical is hard. IT is truly global. Moral differ. And what we do is complicated. A lot of consequences are unintentional, something we won't know for a long time. I grabbed a bunch of articles about software development industry and threw it into the world crowd. And we got names of the giants, but we also got things like harassment, uh, allegations, uh, sexual harassment, uh, bad things. This is another complicated slide that I want you to look at. This is a very sad story. A 16-year-old kid died because a nurse who was trying to administer very common medicine was wrong by 38 times. She used this program's interface to calculate the right dose. She was wrong by 38 times. The person died. 
Somebody coded that. Somebody tested that. Somebody looked at that and approved it and let it go to the hospitals across the country. Uh, Volkswagen uh, crisis that happened a couple of years ago already. The software that people were building, the team was building, was measuring stuff, uh, was measuring emissions differently for tough situations. And then we learned that other companies did that. So is all software that we are building good? Should we be concerned about data that, we, that companies keep? Is it okay not to fix a bug? Is it acceptable to uh, uh, de deliver untested product? Ask a question about the software you are working on. What can possibly go wrong? Do you want to be responsible for that? Because you are. With great power comes responsibility. If, uh, a little while ago, United was on the ground because of a computer gl glitch for three years. Was there any harm done? Probably. Somebody didn't make a funeral. Somebody didn't make a business meeting. Somebody didn't get to childbirth. Uh, this smart Barbie came out a few years ago and it was listening to private conversations between kids and, their doll, and the doll, right? So everything that's private in the house went to a third party company that was trying to transcribe it and make sure Barbie answers intelligently. What uh, ethics questions should we be concerned about? And who is responsible? As developers, are we responsible for the stuff that we are doing that is doing bad things. One of the uh, uh, software products that I was astonished to find out about is Securus Technologies. Video jail visitation. You, can, you are not allowed to visit people in many jails now because you are supposed to use Skype. The company makes money off it, but it cuts out human contact. Finally, there is a question of software development industry practices. Is it okay to uh, sacrifice uh, diversity for perceived productivity? Do you keep a jerk on the team if you think they're a high performer? Those are decisions teams face every day. What are your concerns? Usually we come into the office and we go straight to solving the next user story. This is something to stop and think about on your way back, maybe. Thank you.